Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, also with Carleton University um, Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. As we lose more and more sea ice in the Arctic and snow cover, and the, the whole Arctic region is darkening and warming up much, much faster due to albedo feedbacks, the big question mark is how much methane is going to come up? You know, how strong is the methane feedback going to be? We already know that the methane levels, the dissolved methane levels in the water column and, and uh, methane levels in the air above uh, specific regions of the Arctic are starting to rise fairly rapidly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to review uh, this paper here, discuss in detail in a few videos this review paper from the middle of 2016 on the effects of climate change on the emissions from the seafloor sediments in the Arctic Ocean. And I've been saying for quite a while that this is a climate change emergency. And as a result, um, we have this uh, flashing red light here to signify an emergency. So anyway, I'll get rid of my props for now. And let's talk about this paper with many, many different authors. Um, and so basically, there's large quantities of methane stored in the hydrates. Hydrates are basically frozen water around methane molecules and permafrost. So this is permanently frozen ground within the shallow marine sediments in the Arctic Ocean. So obviously, if the water column above th starts sawing out the sediment, then we get release of methane. But the fate of this methane released is, there's a lot of different processes that are, that are going on. So I'm gonna talk about some of the physical and bio ge biogeochemical processes that regulate the amount of methane movement or flux across the seabed what this methane does in the water column and how much can be released to the atmosphere. So right now the fluxes of dissolved methane are moderated by both anaerobic, so this is bacterial breakdown anaerobically in the absence of oxygen, and aerobic, which is in the presence of oxygen of the methane. If the fluxes um, increase, then more methane will be transported by advection. This is movement in ocean currents or in the gas phase. So this is bubbles which would then rise up through the water column and this would reduce the efficiency of the methanotrophic sink which is this is the bacteria both anaerobically and aerobically that breaks down the methane. Higher freshwater discharge to the Arctic Shelf Seas and this will be from melting sea ice, melting ice from Greenland but also increased um, I increased fresh water coming into the Arctic region from surrounding rivers on the continent surrounding the Arctic. This will increase the stratification because this is fresh water. Fresh water is lighter, it floats on the surface. And actually, um, there's um, the stratification in the Arctic is such that there's warmer water down below. The reason why it's down below and heavier than this colder fresh water on the surface is because it's higher salinity. It's derived from both the Arctic, or, or the Atlantic and the Pacific uh, oceans. And so this stratification can block some of the transfer of the methane gas to the surface, but also increased stratification can lead to a warming of the water below, increasing the hydrate dissociation. When there's loss of sea ice, there's higher wind speeds, and therefore there's more exchange of the methane from the water to the air, um, so looking at these, we, we, there's limited studies on this. So when there's sea ice, the methane can be trapped below, concentrations can be up to you know, five, ten times higher below the ice. When the ice goes in, that methane can be released unless there's um, bacterial breakdown of the methane on the bottom of the sea ice, for example, from, from these um, microbes. But so basically during melting, as the melting increases, it's very likely that the methane flux is higher. In fact, we're measuring it being higher. 
So recent observations around this anaerobic and aerobic oxidation, how the bubbles are transported, the effect of the water, the depth of the water column, the ice cover, wave action, etc., are things that this paper all discusses. So let's get into some of the nitty gritty. So the first question is, how much, um, how, how, how much does the methane is in the Arctic and subarctic marine sediments? Okay, it's believed that there's vast amounts. And let's just go to look at the image here, the table. So this is the present uh, thought. Um, methane hydrates, now look at the huge range here. 30, first of all, in the air right now, or in 2011, there was about five gigatons of methane in the atmosphere. Of course, that's higher than that now but that's sort of the ballpark, five gigatons. So in the, the methane hydrates in the marine sediments, the estimate is 30 to 9,000 gigatons. Now, obviously this is a huge range and the amount stored depends on the hydrate saturation. Um, and it is stored typically at a level where the temperature and pressure um, are favorable for freezing the water matrix around the methane. The consensus is on a few hundred gigatons, um, you know, so, so, but this is highly uncertain. We obviously need much better, um, we need to narrow down this range um, as, and, and we better do it fast because we're liable to lose the sea ice completely um, in the summer uh, within a few years, especially given that it's not forming properly uh, this winter. Submerged permafrost, look at the range, two to 1400 gigatons. It's, it's highly uncertain. Yeah, well, I mean, look at the range. Um, so this one paper, McGuire gave two to 65 gigatons for the entire Arctic. However, Shikova, so the Russians reported 1400 gigatons alone on the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf. So 540 gigatons is hydrate and 360 gigatons is free gas trapped underneath the permafrost. So so the, there's a huge range again in this number. The range is tighter in the permafrost on land, the terrestrial permafrost. Um, and this is a more recent paper. So there's loads of methane there. Okay, so there's lots of methane there um, that is potentially able to come out as the Arctic is warming. Of course, when you think about the, so let's go to the sort of um, geometry of the Arctic here, the geography, geometry. Um, so here's the Arctic Ocean surrounded by all the continents. This is the scale here down to 5,000 meters below sea level. Um, the darkest blue areas and um, the, the Lomonosov Ridge going across. Um, and you can see that there's lots of shallow regions here and methane coming up from the seafloor in shallow regions um, is a lot of it will get up to the atmosphere. Also, when I talk about the hydrate zones of the methane um, hydrate zones where, where hydrates can exist, um, about 400 odd meters or so of depth, there's lots of locations where the, there's slopes where that will happen. There's also lots of faulting and we're getting earthquakes occurring in the Arctic, and these are liable, these lead to the question of will they cause massive landslides, which would then release lots of hydrates episodically. So there's lots of risks from that. So let's continue on. Um, okay, so we're losing sea ice. Um, we're, we, we're losing sea ice. The water, that comes into the Arctic that, so the water underneath is warmer. I said that the water at the surface is fresh and it's cooled by the atmosphere. And it's, so it's lighter because it's fresh and you can have warmer water heavier than that. So layers of warmer water below because it's higher, the salinity is higher. It's water derived from deep Atlantic waters. Um, and also Pacific waters. So these Atlantic waters, um, they're, they're up to, they may, the temperatures are rising up to about one degree Celsius 
above the, the uh, pre-1999 mean. So these waters are warming and this is causing shoaling. So what that means is these waters are coming up closer to the surface by up to 90 meters um, beyond where they were before. Um, the temperatures of the Pacific water flowing into the Arctic through the Bering Straits is also warmer by half a degree. Um, and that's also, that's changing the um, ocean currents and, and the properties of the Arctic. So we're also seeing, um, you know, uh, so let's have a look at the, our, let's go, go to the methane in the Arctic marine sediments. So it's, how does it get in the sediment? Well, it's produced by either cracking of complex organic molecules at high temperatures and great depths. So if it's very deep in the earth, those complex organic molecules are broken down and the polymers and you can get methane produced. It's also produced by the microbial transformation of organic, so microbes working on organic and inorganic carbon at shallower depths. So um, at relatively low temperatures, less than 10 C and moderate pressures, three to five megapascals, and this is the combined water and sediment depths of 300 to 500 meter. This, and this is common on the continental slopes, methane and water combine to form the methane hydrate. So it's an ice cage around the methane molecule. Um, below that, methane can exist as a free gas below the depth of this zone, and that may be transferred directly into the water if there's faults and fractures. So let's go, let's continue on. So off Svalbard, um, we've seen um, enough, 250 plumes of methane bubbles were, were seen close to the depth where the hydrate stability zone outcrops on the seafloor. So it was exposed about 400 meters deep, and this was associated with hydrate dissociation due to seasonal water temperature change. Um, we know that the um, September, that the, the sea ice is rapidly going, and this has a big effect on the water temperatures, which will then have a big effect on the methane and the methane hydrates. So this is an interesting schematic showing hydrates in the Arctic Ocean. So we have this curve here, it's called the hydrate stability curve, the red curve. We have water depth here in meters and temperature here. So this curve shows above this curve, you have methane gas and seawater. Below this hydrate curve, you would have the methane encased in this frozen water. So that would occur at minus five degrees at slightly more than 100 meters. As you go deeper and deeper, it can happen at higher and higher temperatures. Um, down to about seven or eight degrees at 700 meter combined, um, like the water depth and the sediment depth combined. So you've got this curve and this is the water profile temperature. So the water profile temperature, um, so it's close to about four degrees because at four degrees you have maximum density of water. Um, as you go lower than four, the hydrogen bonding uh, makes the water molecules separate a little bit and the, so the density increases, which is why ice floats on top of water. So, so this is the point where, so where the temperature is lower, where, where, where the temperature is lower than this curve, you have hydrate stability and where the temperature goes to greater than it because of the geothermal heating, as you go deeper and deeper in the earth, this, it, you get the heating. So this is the other side where, so at this point here forms the one line and this is the other line. So this is where the hydrate would be stable. And because the sediments are only in here, this is the sediment region where the hydrates would form. So this is in these sediments, there's pores where the water can go through and you can have methane dissolved in that water and it can be advected or the methane, the methane will, is coming up from the bottom, diffuses up and I'll talk more about some of the processes now that happen in that hydrate zone, but I will have to uh, continue that in the next part of, of this video. So thank you, for, um, thank you for paying attention, and my website is paulbeckwith.net. Please have a look at it. Thanks.